is Justin Ford for From the Frontline. Tonight we are dealing with George Verwer, Mission Mobilizer Extraordinary. In the studio with me is Dr. Peter Hammond, the founder of Frontline Fellowship, who has been involved in serving persecuted Christians for over 40 years in 38 countries. In our recent shows about Christian literature, episodes 254 and 255, uh, Dr. Hammond, you touched on George Verwer and Operation Mobilization. In light of recent news, today's show is entirely devoted to George Verwer, a remarkable, remarkable man with whom you shared a passion for literature, evangelism, and Christian leadership training. Yes, well, in fact, George Verwer passed away on the 14th of April after a brief battle with cancer. Uh, just a year ago, I think he had three heart bypasses. He is very active right up to the very end. Um, good innings, 84 years old. But he leaves behind his wife, Drenna, and his three children, Ben, Daniel, and Krista, and a whole lot of grandchildren too. Uh, but it's so important that we focus on him because George Verve is one of the great missionaries of the 20th century. He's one of the greatest of the missionary mobilizers. In fact, it's calculated that he motivated and mobilized tens of thousands of missionary volunteers to proclaim God's love around the globe. And in many ways, he's really the, the initiator, the innovator of short-term missions and the short-term missionary movement. So Operation Mobilization grew to be one of the biggest missions in the world, and out of it has grown many other great missions. So uh, he really is a massively important figure. Uh, the global church has really lost one of its greats, and it's so important that we learn from this man who's joined the great cloud of witnesses. And you had a personal relationship with George Verwer. Yes, uh, he is a, a good personal friend and a good friend of our mission, and a co-worker of Bill Bathman. My wife, Lenore, remembers Uncle George being a regular guest around their dinner table in their home in Salzburg in Austria. Um, he had what he called his 100 Gideon men, and uh, he said movers and shakers who, um, who were going to change the world. And so uh, he said, Gideon had 300, I've only got 100, but he counted me one of his Gideon men, and we were privileged to be part of his special projects. Uh, doing different assignments that uh, he was able to help us to fulfill. So George Verver has been a guest here in this mission house. We've hosted him. I've been his uh, guide and host and uh, driver sometimes. And magnificent to learn firsthand from one of the most colorful missionaries of all time. Can you tell us a bit more about what kind of man he was and how would you describe his personality and his physical appearance? Well, he is tall and he had a trademark uh, global vest. Uh, his, his jacket was um, basically a world map, and uh, he had a massive inflatable uh, global ball that you'd blow up and then you'd toss around at the pulpit and you'd spin around and point out, uh, you know, Mongolia, Afghanistan, India, and start to relate facts about these different mission fields as part of his look at the fields. Um, he was a very colorful person, not just in his clothing. Um, he is described as devout, energetic, single-minded, visionary, goal-orientated. Uh, he described himself as having ADHD. Um, very resourceful. He is steadfast. He is quick-witted, innovative, adventurous, eccentric, uh, generous, and gracious. Uh, just one example. At a public meeting, a church deacon stood at the back and ostentatiously dangled his metal watch uh, in order to attract George Verver's attention as to the time. And so he shouted out, praise God, there's a man offering his watch for the cause of world missions. And the deacon sat down very promptly. But that's a typical George Verve of how to respond to people trying to distract you with irritating things like you've gone over time. Um, can you please describe a bit more about George Verve's uh, biography, his background, his early life, and how he came to be a Christian? Yes, he's from Dutch background. His uh, uh, parents were Netherlanders and... Uh, even though he was born in America, uh, in New Jersey, he came from pretty humble beginnings. Um, he was something of an entrepreneur early on. From age 14, he started a business. Uh, he soon had 200 uh, other youngsters working for him, selling fire extinguishers. And he had a very um, entrepreneurial way of doing it. They'd take a bit of gasoline, they'd start a fire just outside someone's um, home, and uh, then extinguish it to the fire extinguisher and said they sold hundreds of these fire extinguishers. It was a very effective um, marketing strategy. Uh, well, um, you can see some of the fingerprints of some people and institutions of the post-war era of the 20th century. Um, he grew up in New Jersey, very close to New York, 
And a local woman uh, put him on what he described as the Holy Ghost hit list and started to pray not just for him to be converted but for him to be a missionary and sent him in a post the Gospel of John, which he was reading on and off when someone invited him in 1955 to a Billy Graham event uh, in Madison Square Garden, New York. And he was offered a free ticket, and he liked the idea of it being free. So he went there, and he was moved to make a commitment to Christ uh, through Billy Graham's preaching that night, and felt committed to commit to world missions and to spreading the gospel for the rest of his life. So he later ended up in Moody Bible Institute, where he met his wife, Drenna, and uh, uh, he was actually, uh, he, he described it as love at first sight, but for her it was uh, love at first fright, for her, as the description. But he went up to, he said um, he had been, um, he said his greatest interest aside from making money was having relationships with girls. And he said he went through 33 girlfriends before he turned 18. And uh, so he said, walking onto this campus, he said immediately, there's just so many beautiful girls that were, you know, seven he was infatuated with almost immediately. Uh, but the one that he was most attracted to was Drena. She worked at, I think, the library. So he walked up to her and said, if you marry me, you'll probably be eaten by cannibals in New Guinea, uh, which probably wasn't the best uh, line. But he said um, uh, she was young and impressionable and uh, she respected him because heard that he is, you know, very evangelistically uh, involved and active out there. And uh, so... To test whether Drenner would be suitable missionary material, he took on a date to a local park and fished out of a trash can some half-eaten meal and offered these thrown-away leftovers for her lunch. And when Drenner accepted this humble meal, George was convinced she could handle life of a missionary wife. So, quite extraordinary. Well, he gave away his wedding, his engagement ring because he believed that someone else needed more. And... He took their wedding cake uh, to sell at the first gasoline station for fuel as they drove to Mexico for a mission. He said that he didn't want to spend any money driving to Mexico. They wanted to, to be able to trust the Lord for the fuel. He said the first two places he stopped and offered to sell his wedding cake, they just gave him the fuel for free. He said that the third gasoline station took the cake um, and uh, filled up his tank. And uh, he said at, uh, for accommodation, he couldn't afford to stop just anywhere, so... Um, he would go up to a pastor's manse many times in those days. It was quite common to have the manse right next to the church, which was quite easy to find. And he'd say, you know, we've um, just been married and we're on our way to Mexico on a mission and uh, could we spend nights here? And he said they're normally very generous and put them up very enthusiastically. And uh, one pastor he mentioned um, actually the next day gave him a dollar. And he said, as it so happened, that was an answer to prayer because the night before he had felt his wife was struggling with, you know, how extremely cold it was. It was winter and that she needed some encouragement. So he had spent a dollar on a hot chocolate for her. And uh, so he wanted this money back and had actually prayed that, that God would reimburse him the dollar because he wants to reach Mexico with a full amount of money for the different books and Bibles I want to buy to the street. So uh, real mission by faith. So you can see he was quite a, uh, he was quite a serious and... Uh, fanatical person, the way he describes it. Is he, is, he, he had a real gift of, of judgmentalism and criticism. He harassed his people in early missions that you don't just use a tea bag once, tea bags must be reused again and again. And he he just found every way to save money and to be able to live on the land and you you know, you didn't waste money on things like uh, food and accommodation. Forget about clothes, you know. No, you, everything went into literature and ministry. So that really describes the kind of person you know, when you meet George Verver, uh, to, just, to quote his wife, Drenna says, I get tired just looking at him. Uh, just to look at George Verver makes you tired because he was such a hyper-energetic person that uh, he made everyone around him um, exhausted. So <clears throat> we've heard that he made a commitment to missions. Um, can you um, elaborate on how yes. the young George Verver proceeded to fill that commitment? Yes, so he had a roommate at his college and... Uh, so he was only 18th at the stage. We're talking about 1956. George Verver and his uh, friend Dale Roten uh, prayed. And the moment they finished praying in this dorm room, this is in Maryville College of Tennessee, uh, George Verver looked up and said to his uh, mate, uh, Dale, well, are you ready to go? And he had only just heard Verver's idea that they sell everything they owned and use the money to buy a truck 
that summer to fill it with Spanish language editions of the Gospel of John and drive it to Mexico, where 70% of people didn't even have access to the scriptures. So uh, immediately uh, Dale said, George, it takes longer than that. I mean, he'd only just heard about this idea and he wants him to sell everything and join this operation. And George Weber said, well, I don't see why it should. Um, you know, there's a need. We can meet that need. Uh, the rest just doesn't really matter. And so um, his friend Dale wrote and said, his one all-consuming passion in life has been to be a channel whereby people will become lifelong friends of Jesus. His comfort zone is breaking out of his comfort zone. The only time he feels really secure is when he's risking everything. So um, that's really how he got involved. It was Mexico was the first mission, but he did open air preaching. He was a real outdoor uh, go and um, whether it's door to door or um, in the streets, uh, he would be preaching and challenging people right from the beginning. And what was the ultimate fruit of George Verwa's um, trip to Mexico? Well, that's really out of which his mission grew out. Uh, at first, he called it Send the Light, um, which later on he launched a literature ministry of Operation Mobilization known as Send the Light Trust, which became the biggest literature ministry in, on earth. Uh, so his favorite hymn was Send the Light. And um, you could say it all started in 1957 when he did his first cross-border mission into Mexico with Walter Borchard and Dale Roten. And the main goal was distributing literature and gospels. And uh, literature has always been a key part of the work. So he literally wrote the book on literature evangelism. Literature and evangelism describes all of his life's work in many ways. And so after 1960, they turned to Europe. And, of course, they'd been learning Spanish from ministering in South America. So it was logical to go to Spain, which in 1960 was a closed country. It was under the... Um, Roman Catholic aligned um, governments of, of Franco and they had a concordat with Rome that they wouldn't allow any Protestants into the country. And in fact, Bill Bathman described seeing a Protestant minister beaten to death in a marketplace with a Catholic priest standing over his body, bleeding body, sucking on a cigarette and not allowing anyone to help him. So it was that bad. They literally had to smuggle Bibles into Spain in the 1960s. So Bill Bathman met uh, George Viver in Spain and it's in Spain that uh, George Viver started to see that the best way to be reaching these huge amounts of areas that hadn't heard the gospel was lots of short-term missionaries. And so in discussing this with Bill Bathman, Bill Bathman said, well, you don't need to go back to America for the volunteers. You can get them from Europe. There are pockets of Christians all over England and France and Germany and so on. You can get your short-term volunteers from local churches here. And that will, of course, lower costs increased participation. So um, George Viver's vision really got launched in Europe after his ministry in Spain. Um, he actually uh, did, uh, it was the days of a Bible smuggler, um, God smuggler, Brother Andrew. Um, and so George Viver actually did his first cross-border mission into Russia with Bibles, got arrested, accused of being a spy, and... Uh, they threatened all sorts of things, and uh, he came back in, in defeat. As he said, don't ever be afraid of failure. Failure is just the back door to success. And he described it as God's bungler. That, uh, you know, he wasn't God's smuggler. That's what he had hoped to be, but he became God's bungler. He bungled his first Bible smuggling off. But out of it came the idea that, look, I'm not called to do this. Brother Andrew and Bill Bath are the ones who do behind enemy lines work better. But what I can do is mobilize people for evangelizing in Europe, Western Europe. So the whole idea of, of Operation Mobilization grew out of this. And when he explained his vision to Bill Batham, Bill Batham said, well, you've got to move to England. Uh, we've got a lot of Christians. And he explained his network, and he had networks of Bible studies and coffee bars all over England. And they became his platform to, to launch from. So uh, out of that failure of the uh, Russian Bible smuggling attempt, which was a debacle, um, came the incredible runaway success of Operation Mobilization. Can you <clears throat> just explain a bit more about what exactly Operation Mobilization does yes. and, what it, and what it is? I guess the word mobilization provides a clue. Yeah, mobilize to evangelize. So the global impact of OM is absolutely enormous. Uh, George Viver, by God's grace, built up what became the biggest mission in the world. He really is the pioneer of short-term missionary outreaches. So OM 
now has 3,300 full-time workers from 134 countries and are working in 147 countries around the world. It's estimated that well over 160,000 people have participated in OM outreach, has been through the training and been involved in a short-term outreach. Uh, that's 160,000. And it's calculated that they have reached collectively about a billion people have been reached with the gospel through the various ministries of OM in the last 60 years. So, I mean, that sounds pretty impressive figures, but uh, you need to remember that OM didn't have influence or resources or staff at the beginning. Uh, they've got a massive ministry footprint, but they didn't start that way. They started out with just three men um, crossing the board in a truck with a bunch of Gospels of John in Spanish. And uh, when I first met George Verve, it was at a Stellenbosch University sending week, mission week. And he had just spoke in a student kirk, which was packed out. And as he walked by in the hallway uh, to get out of the church, um, I reached out a hand and I stated, I'm the son-in-law of Bill Baffman. And at this, George River stopped immediately. He whirled around and he exclaimed, Bill Baffman is the reason there isn't Operation Mobilization. And George related to the people standing around how Bill Bathman interviewed him in Spain, invited him to come for a series of meetings in England, and Bill Bathman's organization network provided the platform and initial recruits for Operation Mobilization, including Mike Evans, who ended up marrying uh, a, a French woman and running OM in France. Later, Mike Evans became principal at the Geneva Bible Institute, which I've done meetings there with him. Uh, when I first met Mike Evans, he was speaking at the Minister's Conference at Quasimanta Mission, and as Bill Bath and I walked in, he shouted across uh, the auditorium, Bill Bath is a very dangerous man. He invited me for one summer outreach, and it ended up being a lifetime, 30-something years and counting, um, ended up moving to France, learning French, marrying a French woman, and uh, all that, and he said, uh, you know, it all started with Bill Bath, and it's all his fault. My whole life was uh, sidetracked into this. And uh, interestingly, uh, in 1962, OM's first short-term missions teams moved into Europe. And they came from Britain, Spain, Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, the US, and elsewhere. So they had 200 in their first summer outreaches. The next summer, they had 2,000. And it kept growing until they've now had 160,000. So um, 1963, there were more than 2,000 who blanketed Europe to encourage Christians and carry the word of God throughout the continent. And his ways of operating was his um, missionaries and volunteers didn't receive any funding. They didn't receive um, anything more than books to sell, books and Bibles to sell. So they took little, what he described as card tables, collapsible tables that you'd set up in a bus station, train station, and they'd have to sell books. If, if they sold books and Bibles, they'd have money for the next train tickets, uh, place to stay and food. If not, well, they'd starve tough. So basically, the whole operation was run on literature ministry and selling books, selling books and Bibles. And it was quite effective because uh, they even managed to move into countries where the Bible was illegal, such as Spain. And, you know, the whole idea was, but you're not allowed to do press ministry here. There was no such thing as a press and book ministry or bookshop or, of course, Protestant radio programs. But because they were selling books, it was he convinced the radio station as a commercial enterprise and he's got the right to advertise his materials on the radio station. So he'd do promotion of the Bible, why it's the most important book to read and so on, or different books and give summaries of this. So they were basically using the adverts on radio to preach the gospel. So they got, uh, as they tried Mexico, they worked out in Spain and other parts in Europe where it was totally Catholic, like Italy. Um, they started with a commercial base of selling things, and uh, they also found that people don't necessarily come to your table um, with just the books there. So you've got to be a bit of like a newspaper salesman. You know, uh, read the number one best-selling book of all time and you know, be giving the different stats of, of how great the Bible is and how important this book is and how this book changed your life. And, you know, Born Again by Billy Graham or um, Steps to Happiness, uh, Billy Graham's teaching on um, the Beatitudes and things like this. And so they would be literally like newspaper salesmen shouting out some slogans to attract people's interest to buy the books. And uh, this became so phenomenally successful and it was 
basically a self-funding model. It's a commercial model uh, to get the gospel out. And uh, their teams didn't require lots of money because they were selling books. As long as they sold books, uh, they were meeting people, discussing, praying with people, and the ministry was advancing. So OM um, started with Western Europe. Soon they started to go behind the Iron Curtain. In fact, Bill Bathman and his pioneers organized training um, sessions in Salzburg, or actually outside Salzburg in Grosskammern, where they trained these short-term teams for Bible smuggling ops behind the Iron Curtain. And Bill Bathman even rigged up a machine that would blow cigarette smoke in people's face because none of them would smoke. But they would be getting cigarette smoke blown in their face, so they organized a machine that would be blowing cigarette smoke in people's faces while they're being interrogated. They'd rip them out of their beds in the middle of the night and drag them down to the cellar and big spotlights and start to interrogate them like they'd just been captured by some KGB or security party bunch and uh, trying to uh, see if the people will stand and what their frame of mind would be and giving them advice on how to deal with possible interrogation, how to answer questions and so on, and how to evangelize in a hostile environment. So they did work behind line curtain. They also began work in the Middle East, and they started to work in India as well in 1963. And India became, in fact, OM's biggest mission field. They'd done a phenomenal amount of work in India. And uh, I think something incredible like they've planted over 107 schools in India and planted over 3,000 churches in India uh, just in the last year. So that's phenomenal achievements in a country that many people think, well, that's a Hindu country, but there's now millions of Christians in India. And then that wasn't enough. He started to come up with an idea of how can we reach the unreached areas, and he came up with the idea of, of mission ships that would be floating bookshops to go into harbors in the Middle East and the 1040 window into Asia and South America and sell great Christian books and educational textbooks and so on. And so they soon expanded their ministry with the MV Dulos, MV staying for missionary vessel, um, MV Dulos, MV Logos 1, and then the MV Logos Hope. And uh, at the moment, there's only the Logos Hope still operational. The others have been retired. But uh, these ships have done the most amazing work. Uh, really, I'd call it God's Navy. They've been all over the world, and uh, just um, the Logos ship, for example, had more than 6.5 million people visit the ship in 408 ports of call in 108 countries. So absolutely phenomenal ministry, about 5,000 titles on board that they sell. And of course, they have volunteers from about 40 different countries in the world on board as the staff of the ships at any one time. They raise their own support. They all have to work on a ship. They all get duties. And, of course, when they get to a port, they have ministry as well, uh, in addition to their ship's duties. So uh, this has been a phenomenal ministry. Uh, they've been working behind uh, the Iron Curtain as well. Um, and, uh, for example, they started a campaign um, called Love Europe, where they would recruit thousands of young people to come together and uh, on one occasion, just in July 1989, before the fall of the Iron Curtain, they planned for 5,000 young people from 50 countries to participate. In fact, 7,000 volunteers from 76 countries came. And this was the beginning of the Love Europe Conference, which um, basically was a, a summer evangelism mobilization program. And I've been ministering in different parts of Europe and suddenly seen an OM team singing or doing a drama in the middle of the market square, doing open air preaching in the local languages, such as in Belgium. So uh, they, they go far and wide. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on the floating um, bookshops, which seem to yes. be probably the most uh, famous? Well, product. yes, we've had them come in Cape Town. My children have been standing at the docks waving Christian flags while the Dulos of the Logos came into ports and Salvation Army Band was playing. It's quite an exciting event. So uh, OM operates um, Logos Hope, MV Logos Hope. Um, tragically, uh, the first ship they purchased, the MV Logos, ran aground and sank off Tierra del Fuego um, in, off the coast of Chile. Now it's something of a tourist attraction. See the wreck that's um, still visible uh, on the rocks there. 
Uh, it was atrocious weather conditions, 1988. The ship couldn't be saved, but not a single crew member was lost. Nobody was even injured. Uh, but you can imagine it's a massive disaster when you lose an entire missioning ship went down. Uh, but uh, they've replaced that ship with, with uh, the Logos Hope now. And uh, it had already had 6.5 million people visit the ship uh, in 108 countries. So Logos had been well used. Uh, then they got another ship, the Antonio Lazaro, became the MV Logos II, um, which served for several years before being retired in 2008. Uh, the third ship of, Logo, of Operation Mobilization was the MV Dulos, Dulos meaning servant or slave, actually. And it's held the record for being the oldest ocean-going ship still in service. And Dave, George liked to say that the Dulos was launched the same year that the Titanic was. But the Dulos is still afloat. The owners of the Titanic boasted that not even God could sink the Titanic. We say only God can keep the Dulos afloat. And the Dulos was retired at the end of 2009. But uh, it never sank, unlike Titanic. It just shows it's better to trust God than to try and provoke him. And uh, the MV Logos Hope was launched in service in Kiel 2009, twice the size of the Dulos. Therefore, provides much greater capacity to serve communities. They've got everything from a full ministry, children's ministry, coffee bar ministry, massive bookshop, of course, because it's mostly a floating bookshop. And so the OM ships have visited port cities throughout the world, including Cape Town, supplying literature, encouraging cross cultural understandings. And when their teams arrive, they have advanced teams, but then all the ship's crew go on shore during day and they do outreach in different schools and churches. And in the marketplace all around town. So they're going out while people are coming to visit the ship and where they're selling books and having ministry too. So it's a very dynamic, multifaceted ministry. And uh, wherever there's ministries for opportunities, I might add they've been able to sell hundreds of thousands of Christian books, even in Muslim closed countries, but not in China. China wouldn't let them sing, sell a single book when they went to Shanghai. Uh, well, since 1970, OM ships have visited over 480 ports in 151 countries and territories around the world. In total, 45 million visitors have come aboard these missionary ships to purchase from the 5,000 titles available on the floating bookshop. And the titles cover a wide range of subjects like science, sports, hobbies, cookery, arts, philosophy, medicine, children's books, faith and life and discipleship. And these books have been carefully chosen to be of interest to every member of the family with educational, social, and moral needs of the local community in mind. And they offer these books at a fraction of their retail value. And while in some ports they've donated many books, depending on what the financial situation is in that area. And the impact of these floating Christian bookshops has been immense. And the, the book ministry falls under the title of Send the Light, which is the name of George Weber's favorite hymn. And also uh, the first name he thought of naming the mission. Is Europe still a mission field serviced by um, OM, or have they shifted their focus to other parts? <coughs> Europe is most certainly still a mission field. OM is working in 30 countries in Europe at the moment. It's probably one of the main areas. <coughs> but I would say um, Asia is its most important mission field with India probably being the country that's got the highest concentration of their work. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, the uh, unique m way of distributing books. Um, it also includes bookazines. Yes, one of the cheap ways of distributing books has been using bookwave paper in a magazine format to low cost of binding and so on and low cost of printing. And they've put entire books unabridged into bookazine format. And I read my first Send the Light books like uh, Revolution of Love and Come Live Die in bookazine format. Now, very cheap, inexpensive, easy to distribute. So uh, just giving you a bit of an idea, when the cost of the average book was two rand, you could get a bookazine for 60 cents. And, I mean, it should be a full book, some of these great classics, like Roy Hessian's Calvary Road, which is a favorite that uh, Send the Light Trust tried to promote. And so you could you could market, distribute, and sell a lot of them. So bookazines was an innovative way of distributing to a lot of people. Yeah. 
Let's move on to another side of George Furwer. Um, in, his, in the first chapter of his well-known book, Out of the Comfort Zone, he exhorts missionaries to be gracious, or as he puts it, to be grace-awakened, to have the quality of big-heartedness. Um, clearly, this was a topic that was close to his heart. Yes. Now, George Furwer is one of the most brutally honest mission speakers I've ever come across. He could speak openly of his weaknesses, his failings, his sins. He described himself as a natural backslider. He uh, uh, said that he had a gift of judgmentalism and he could be a very pharisaical in the early years, how he ruined so many people's lives and crushed people with his harsh statements. Um, his father had been a drunk. He himself battled numerous sexual sins. He said he had accumulated 33 girlfriends before he turned 18. And he, even after being converted, would fool around with girls he had just led to the Lord. And he described one time that he found himself uh, in intense necking in the parking lot with a girl he had just counseled to the Lord. And he thought, you know, there's something wrong about this. He realized that he's probably abusing uh, the situation. And uh, then he decided that he's going to go cold turkey. But when he arrived at uh, uh, Moody Bible College, he said, you know, he suddenly felt this huge temptation. He said, so many attractive girls there and he had all these crushes. And anyway, he ended up proposing to Drenner, um, who was willing to be eaten by cannibals in New Guinea, apparently. So um, I heard on a number of occasions at mission conferences, George confessed how he had battled with pornography. And even one time he chose to go on a retreat to a forest for an extended time of prayer for a deeper life. He came across a pornographic magazine hanging over a branch. He said, I wish I could say how I'd resisted the temptation and fled from it, but sadly not. And he spoke about how the flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He said he had first come to Europe with an ugly American legalism, and we all need a grace awakening. And he speaks about these sort of things in his books, Messiology, saying where you get two or three Christians together, you get a mess. And it's, uh, it's amazing, but God and his grace uses messy people who often are messed up in their theology. God uses broken people, and you don't have to be perfect. In fact, there are no perfect people. The only perfect person ever was Jesus. So <clears throat> he encourages us to stop being so judgmental and so harsh and condemning. God is using broken people who have failed to win a lost world. And so he's written books like Drops from a Leaking Tap and Confessions of a Toxic Perfectionist. Where he warns against pharisaical judgmentalism and Christian legalism, <clears throat> and speaking about how we can get vaccinated against the gospel, and it, it's so dangerous that we don't get the the vaccination, the um, inoculation against real Christianity. We have just enough to make you immune to the real thing, and so you know a religious spirit can be very dangerous. And that when there's Christians suffering for Christ, you know, like Orthodox Christians in the Middle East or in Eastern Europe, have suffered the most persecution in history. And here we are in the West who've suffered very little, and we've got a rapture, escapism kind of ideas, and we feel ourselves so morally superior. And he said, you know, as a new Christian, he remembers going to Europe and looking at these Christians who could have some wine. You know, Tim, you've got to be a complete teetotaler, which the way I feel as well. Uh, but when you see Bible-believing Christians who who've taken some wine with their suppers, of course they're against drunkenness, to look down them or to look and say, oh, well, those girls are wearing trousers or earrings or some makeup, therefore uh, they can't be Christians. And he says, but uh, how interesting you get the Christians in Eastern Europe who look at these Westerners who come and the girls are wearing trousers, not dresses, and they've got some makeup and earrings. They can't be Christians. And the Westerners are looking at the pastor in the, West, in the East who's got some wine on his table. You know, he can't be a Christian. And it needs for us to stop being so judgmental and harsh and perfectionistic. And uh, he says there's a need for a revolution of love and a grace awakening. So what we need is radical discipleship and a theology of suffering, not a theology of prosperity, not extreme views when it comes to healing, that it's always God's will to heal everybody and things like this. He says what we need is is balance and see the hand of God, recognize the hand of God at work in other cultures and other characters and other denominations and other organizations that can be quite different from your own. But God is obviously a lot more tolerant and gracious than we are because he uses people that we probably would uh, write off and even people we'd condemn to hell. So George Verve would speak very straight about the need for grace. And uh, we have to have a ministry of balance, giving utmost priority to fulfilling the Great Commission recognizing the need to be good Samaritans, caring for those. He speaks about the, the seven um, 
global tragedies uh, on the side of the road that the Good Samaritans need to te- deal with, which includes people in abject poverty, caring for unborn babies, those without access to clean water, loving God's creation, working to protect God's creatures, clean up the environment. As Christians, we should be involved in social justice issues like these as well. Obviously, our first priority is the Great Commission and preaching the gospel in word and deed. Um, but we mustn't neglect works of grace and mercy and kindness, um, love and action on the way. So he was very zealous in evangelism for preaching in open air in town squares, but he's deeply concerned for the environment and for social justice and things like provision of clean water and all of that. He was a team player. I was always amazed that the man who founded the, one of the largest missions in the world was genuinely concerned for little ministries and generous in supporting those of us involved in what he describes as cutting-edge pioneer ministry, especially in restricted access areas. So that even though he had a big enough mission to worry about in his own mission, uh, he was concerned about our little mission and trying to help us with our projects, whether in Sudan or the Congo, or Zambia or Zimbabwe for that matter. And uh, he helped us with projects we were involved in in Mozambique and many different places. So uh, I must say George Viver is an extraordinary example. You know, when you speak about him being a colorful missionary, he was colorful in many ways, not just speaking about his uh, global jacket. Yeah, can you, can I just ask you to just elaborate for the listeners when on the when you talk about Christian legalism, are you talking about uh, being judgmental rather than uh, and, and worrying more about <coughs> opinions rather than actions? Yes, so uh, it's so easy to get legalistic of saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, and you you can't have this and that. And amongst the different examples, he uses what Bible translation use. I mean, some people can writes off another missionary because he invited someone from the persecuted church who's using a different Bible from, let's say, the King James Version, which is the best translation, and they're using an inferior translation. And on that basis, many people can um, cut off fellowship and support from people. Uh, there's also, you know, this person comes from a sinful background. This person, uh, you know, was involved in whatever it may be, came out of a homosexual background or a drug drink, was a criminal, was in prison, whatever it was. But there can be this real looking down on and rejecting someone else because of things that God has dealt with and forgiven. You know, when Jesus says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more, who are we to uh, be so ungracious? And that many Christians today are like the Pharisee, stands up, I thank you, God, I'm not like other men, I'm not like that tax collector over there. So, Seeing how hostile Jesus was to Pharisees and legalism, he said it's disturbing how many of us in the modern evangelical church have fallen into our own version of legalism, where you can't be a real Christian unless you fit into our particular denominational mold and even eschatology, whatever it may be. But uh, not being gracious enough to recognize that, that all Christians have fallen and failed in different ways, but we we are preaching a gospel of redemption and Jesus heals the brokenhearted. He has taken all our griefs and sins upon himself. We need to be gracious to people. If, if God can accept them, that should be good enough for us. Um, apparently, George Voa even had an impact on your work in Sudan. Yes, that's true. So at the Global Consultation on World Evangelism held in 1997 Pretoria, that was actually the biggest missions conference to date at that stage, uh, the main conference was held up at Hatfield, but I was part of the missions executives uh, conference, a much smaller one that was held in the um, Pretoria Baptist Church, very close to the U.S. Embassy downtown. And um, at the missions executives um, special consultation section, uh, George Viver was going through the unreached people's groups under the title of missions mobilization. And uh, he came across the Krongu people of the Noob Mountains and he shouted, Peter Hammond, you go to the Noob Mountains. Here, take the Krongu people as your project. He handed me the file on the Krongu, an unreached people group with no known converts. So on my next mission to the Noob Mountains later the same year, I asked a host in, in the Nuba, do they know about the Krongu? And they directed me to a pastor and evangelist who informed me they were from the Congo tribe. Now, I thought it's totally unreached. Nobody, no Christians amongst them. No, well, about 70% of our tribe are Christians, but there's no Bibles amongst it, no hymn books. They remembered the Australian missionaries from the Sudan United Mission who were expelled by the government back in 1964. There were about five Christians amongst the Kronger tribe at that time, but now more than 70% of the people were evangelical Christians. 
Well, I had to file in the Krongasan now, and you, the Sudan United Mission missionaries from Australia had translated the New Testament into the Krongu language. So after returning from this mission, we tracked down everything that was translated into Krongu, including the New Testament and the hymn book, arranged for these to be printed by the Sudan Literature Centre and uh, in neighbouring Nairobi. And on our next mission, the New Mount, we were privileged to deliver these first New Testaments and hymn books to the Krongu people. There was great rejoicing, and I was told, you have made a thousand tongues to sing. Right there at the airstrip, they started to sing out the Krongu hymn books, and they, we were privileged to deliver this labor of love for missionaries from far away and long ago. Who are not privileged to see the fruits of the gospel seed they had so faithfully sown? You know, we reap where others have sown. Here some Aussie SGM missionaries had done all the translation work, and here we were, over 40 years later, delivering those Bibles and books to the people um, who were the grandchildren, maybe, of the ones that they'd worked amongst. But, uh, you know, that's just one of those things where, you know, thanks to George Viver, we end up giving the Kronger people their New Testaments. Hmm. What else can you tell us about George Wilwer's legacy? Well, it's absolutely extraordinary. One of them is Operation World. One of our good friends and a board member of Frontline is Patrick Johnson of Operation World. And his Operation World project was mobilizing the Dorothea Mission people for their day of prayer to pray for different countries of the world. And so while he's a missionary in Rhodesia, in the Madhubiland area near Bulawayo, where, where I was brought up, uh, um, Patrick Johnson used to organize in uh, apple carts, um, crates, um, files on every country in the world. And he published first a Ronio booklet and later a book on Operation World. Uh, publishers refused it all over the world. Well, um, George Verver looked at this and said, this is the most important missionary book of our era. Um, summary of every country in the world, what's been done, what needs to be done. And so, you know, item for praise, item for prayer, statistics and so on. Uh, Patrick Johnson's a phenomenal missiologist. And he thought, this needs a wider circulation. Well, we've got a big organization. So he said to his people in Send the Light Trust, you must work on us, get a new cover, and publish it, and push it. We must push it all over the world. And so Operation Mobilization made Operation World a worldwide phenomenon. And it, its success is largely due to George Verver's hard work in promoting it. And, of course, Patrick Johnson's the one who did the actual research. But uh, in addition to that, you just think of how George Vivers built up one of the largest mission organizations of the 20th century. OM send out thousands of people every year on short and long-term mission trips. Currently, 3,300 adult workers from 134 countries work in 147 countries of the world. So almost 150 countries of the world have OM workers there. And another 300 other mission agencies were started as a result of contact with OM or launched by former OMers. For example, Youth with a Mission. Youth of the Mission grew out of YOM because OM used to have a policy of uh, no div div divisive t discussions, no talking about baptism, uh, being uh, her, her tongues and things like that. And so the Pentecostals felt a little restricted in OM, and so they launched out into their own group called Youth of the Mission, which is just a Pentecostal version of YOM. So Lauren Cunningham was an OM -er trained under George Viver, and they've got another very huge mission worldwide which has got another mission ship there, Anastasis, which has also been in Cape Town. But um, OM's birthed a good 300 other mission agencies, including Frontiers. The biggest mission to the Muslim world right now is, is something that grew out of uh, OM. And so OM's got a phenomenal legacy, not to mention a phenomenal amount of books. They have launched the biggest publishing ministry in the world, Christian Publishing Ministry, and Send the Light Trust to STL. And... Uh, their websites, their ships, their missionaries all over the world. It is phenomenal. And you can go onto the georgeverver.com website and a lot of his books are available absolutely free, free to download, free ebooks, free Kindle, free PDFs. And, uh, you know, can't beat that price. So he's offering some of the greatest Christian discipleship books available and they're totally free on georgeverver.com website. Are there any other resources you'd like to tell our listeners about, Dr. Hammond? Well, yes. Um, Bill Bathman wrote Going Through Even If Doors Closed, and in that book uh, describes meeting George Verver, and he said everyone he met in Spain knew of George Verver. They either hated him or they loved him. He said there was no one neutral. Um, 
you know, he was a very polarizing person. He would either get people very riled up uh, negatively or positively. Of course, George Weber went through a lot of grace awakening over his years, and he was a lot more gracious uh, by the time I met him than apparently was in the early days when Bill Bethman met him. Uh, but uh, he's always been a dynamo, and he's as passionate against legalism now as he probably was for it um, uh, decades ago. But uh, George Weber was working to his last days. He was in bed fighting cancer, triple heart bypass a few years ago, but right to up to the last days, sending out podcasts, recording things, emailing. I used to get so many letters from him. You know, I'm, I'm in the airport in Singapore about to take off or we just arrived in Hong Kong and you know, wherever he was around the world, he'd be writing some message and sending it off there. So he used his time in the airport terminals or when being driven. Even when I picked him up and drove him around Cape Town, he was sending off messages, speaking to people on the phone, making major decisions, publishing decisions and others, communicating with his mission headquarters in Singapore and all of that. So uh, here's a person who, who put his whole heart and soul and life into ministry, um, and he never stopped seeing the most important thing is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. We must reach a lost world with the gospel of Christ, and we've got to do it in time. It's only good news if it reaches the people in time. It's not good news if they don't hear it. Thank you, Dr. Hammond, for this enlightening and inspiring conversation. Now, in closing, I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you very much for joining us for From the Frontline. God bless and good night.